Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline Podcast. I am your host, Shayna Terrell, educator activist dedicated to the freedom and liberation of her people, the lifelong struggle of it. Thank you once again to all my co-conspirators who come back and watch every, every week. I appreciate you guys. And to our new folks that are in the mix today, welcome. You are in for a great show today. I want to thank everybody who has supported and continues to support our national We Need Black Teachers campaign. If you would like to know more about our campaign, please visit www.weneedblackteachers.org. Please go there and grab yourself some merch while you at it. Nice little t-shirt. I also want to thank those of you who have been watching our episode for the past two weeks for Hispanic Heritage Month. Shout out to all of you. We are still in heavy pursuit of the black and brown get down. We are definitely unified in this struggle. Today, we will be talking about freedom schools and building the black educative pipeline. We'll be discussing the history and tradition of freedom schools and their importance in our communities. So please comment, like, share. And feel free to comment on why you think a freedom school is needed in every community, in every Black community. For me, with our nation facing such a record number, um, we are really in a true epidemic of, of gun violence and deaths to gun violence. I think that really the cause that we are missing and what we are seeing is the absence of programs like freedom schools in our neighborhoods. Children are not getting the love and the support that they need from their communities. Um, but we are going to be talking about our resident expert on freedom schools, my baba, Dr. Greg Carr, today. Um, I've been warned, do not read his entire bio. <laughs> so I'm just going to give him a nice round of applause and great welcome to the show. Welcome, Dr. Carr. Hello, Sister Shana. How are you, beloved? I'm doing good. I am doing all right. You know, again. Good. In this lifelong struggle, freedom, liberation, and trying to navigate no, <laughs> in this world, brother. No question. No question. I'm so glad to be here. The pipeline is going, it's getting built every Thursday. It's getting stronger and stronger. Everybody joining us live and who watches after this is just, it, it's, it's a blessing to be part of a movement that is gaining momentum and connecting. So thank you for having me back always. Of course. Yeah. And we, we appreciate your expertise and guidance and helping us while we're building this pipeline. Well, well we need that. We well, need that. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be a teacher. Oh, yeah. And, and I should also bring uh, greetings and love from the class I just left. Uh, my class, you know, was still virtual with the bigger classes. So um, I teach an education in Black America class at Howard. And uh, the students all told me to tell you hello. We were talking about the Rosenwald schools today. And uh, several of them have family members, grandparents who went to Rosenwald schools like my mother did, who's 93 now. She went to Rosenwald School in Alabama. And these are the schools that Julius Rosenwald donated money um, to uh, over 5000 schools uh, by 1931 that Rosenwald donated money to for black people to have built in the South. And, and, and the genius of it is that over the decades that those schools were built, black people either through direct, through cash, purchase of land and donation of land, uh, labor and building materials actually donated more money than Rosenwald, which is mm. why, with all due respect to Julius Rosenwald, in fact, I was just looking at his uh, biography, uh, Peter es es Escoli's book on Rosenwald. I was like, yeah, with all due respect to Rosenwald, um, I think those schools should be renamed for the black people who gave most of the money for them you know mm. we love we love to uh shout out to all the benefactors but let's be very clear we're talking about freedom it's a different oh. proposition and uh so i'm grateful we're having this topic today it's been heavy on my spirit and i'm glad you agreed to uh to to have this conversation today I just think it's important. I think it's pivotal. I think Freedom Schools connects to so many di different entities um, in the struggle in the life. And I think to talk about Freedom Schools, what they are, their history, tradition, and their importance, I think we're at a pivotal time to be to be doing that. Um, and I think that folks need to see how things they're doing connect to a Freedom Schools movement or things they're doing or saying they're doing aren't a Freedom Schools movement. So I think that that's super important for us to uh, lay out today. I agree. I agree. So yes. let's set this. Oh, let's what you about to say? No, no, no. Let's do it. I was gonna say, let's set this thing off, brother. 
<laughs> so we stay we stay setting it off we definitely stay <laughs> we over here we, stay, we definitely stay setting that thing off grammatically correct usage in ebonics we stay setting it off which would be <laughs> conjugated as a verb to mean that we set it off before we're setting it off now and we will set it off in the future so we stay setting it off so yeah, <laughs> let's okay. let's set it off yeah they setting it off stay ready let's get it stay ready no question. <laughs> you gotta get ready if you stay ready no. <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's the you speak my language right now bro Let's get this. You but, taught me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> teach, look, a teacher who is not lit enough for real. We be talking about the educator pipeline. If you're going to teach black children, and we're talking about building the black educators, we need more black teachers. We need black women and men to join the teaching ranks. Many of them already know this, but if you're a black person who is thinking, I want to be a teacher, one of the things you have to do is be able to listen because the students are going to teach you a great deal. It's going to be an exchange of knowledge. So, yeah. when, you know, when you come in the classroom with your content mastery, which is indispensable, we're not talking about just, you know, subjects that you learned how to teach. No subjects that, you know, content you have content with. And uh, when you come with that, when you come prepared to be able to help students learn, you got to come in and want to know who they are. And a great deal of that is listening. So as an old man, I know, you know, some, I'm learning when to, uh, as young people might say, say less. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm learning, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning, but you got to be able to, to have a conversation with these young people. So that's facts. You, you taught me that, as you say, <laughs> facts. <laughs> facts. facts. <laughs> so Doc, what is a freedom school, right? Like, again, we know that that word kind of gets tossed around. Yeah. But what, like, what is a freedom school and how did they come to be? Honestly, there are two answers to that, mm -hmm. Mr. Shana. And, and for those of you, please, if you're new or if you're spreading the word, encourage folk to go into the archive of this this weekly conversation, the Building the Black Educator Pipeline, because every week adds another brick to this magnificent structure. This is the Shana is bringing folks together to build. And so we've had this conversation on the kind of Okay, how can we call it? The kind of textbook history of freedom schools. Mm -hmm. And so that that that's the easier answer. I mean, you know, when we say freedom schools in the United States, we're typically talking about the schools that came in, uh, that came out of the 1964 uh, human rights struggle that we typically call the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And those schools that came into existence in Mississippi, uh, schools that were under the auspices of the Student Nonviolent yeah, Coordinating yeah, Committee. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the Council of Federated Organizations, you know, our Baba Bob Moses and so many others, Charlie Cobb, who still walks the earth. Um, the curriculum was put together uh, with a group of, of, of teachers, activists in New York City. They built a pipeline. Our young people in Philadelphia have seen that curriculum. It's readily available on the Internet. You can get a copy of that, that the PDF of the document they created. And it was basically based it built on empowering students. And there's been a lot of scholarship written on it. I don't, you know, I like to go to the primary sources. This is a good little book to write in the light of freedom, the newspapers of the 1964 Freedom Schools. And what you have is selections from the school, uh, the newspapers that these young people uh, created. The Freedom Schools were formed around whether it be churches or even some of them outdoors. You get in a circle and uh, there was literacy, there was numeracy. So reading and writing and all the basic skills that you need to get to pursue a good education. Also, civic values, citizenship education, drawing from the work of, among others, Septa McClark and Dorothy mm -hmm. Cotton and those folk coming out of South Carolina and then spreading through the South, the citizenship education program of uh, the um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And we've talked all about all this. So that there's that conventional piece. And then you see uh, the Northern Student Movement right there in Philly, our brother John Churchville. I would encourage folk to get what uh, Dr. Churchville has written. He's still around. There's a couple of his books, um, Driven and Toward Singularity. In this book, uh, Driven, Dr. Churchville talks about the, uh, the work he did with what became the Freedom Day Library and uh, the independent education going on right there in North Philly. This is 1964, 1965, young people. Um, if you ever see the documentary that you can see on YouTube, Black History, Lost, Stolen, or Strayed, you see Churchville and these little children going through the question of building self-esteem and beginning to understand who they are as Black in the world. And so th there's a lot of Freedom School kind of tradition there. And the only other thing I would mention and by way of mentioning, evoke our dear sister, Dr. Kelly Sparrow Mickens, her history of Philadelphia Freedom Schools. Y'all can get that book as well. Uh, we know that in the uh, late 1990s, around 1998, the School District of Philadelphia began a conversation with the Children's Defense Fund mm -hmm. uh, to revive Freedom Schools. By then, CDF had begun to spread Freedom Schools under the leadership of Marion Wright Edelman, 
around the country. And these are uh, platforms with 100 young people, typically K to eight mm -hmm. uh, at, at, a, at a school or a church site, community site. And they're in classrooms of 10 apiece with a college student uh, who is serving as a teacher, college age student, because you didn't have to be in college, you're a college age student. And Philadelphia innovated. Philadelphia said, we're going to put two high school students in those classrooms with college students. And so we had seven freedom schools in 1999, subsidized by the school district of Philadelphia and community partners, uh, 14 the following year, 21 the following year. And to, to, to those high school students were paid. They were subsidized to go to uh, be at those freedom schools as teaching assistants. But they also got high school service learning credit because at that time I was working for the school district of Philadelphia and school district had just uh, mandated that students must get a service learning credit. And so what you saw was that these students got a service learning credit, but in order to do that, they had to create academic portfolios, which means we hired a rack of high school teachers to be their academic advisors. And at the end of our first year, we said, we need a, we need a high school teacher who was a master teacher to kind of coordinate this and become part of this leadership team. And that's when we recruited Dr. Aisha Imani. Uh, who became the first leader of the academic advisors and kind of brought all of her years of master teaching into the structure. So finally, since 1999, Freedom Schools has continued. And one of the great watershed moments of the Freedom Schools Revive movement and Philadelphia Freedom Schools movement, which ultimately became independent of the Children's Defense Fund after a few years because of some of the things we'll talk about, the, 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 the curriculum. We just basically wrote our curriculum from the bottom up around this African-centered approach. Um, we uh, we saw the opening of Sankofa Freedom Academy, uh, mm -hmm. a K-12 freedom school that is there in the Frankfurt section of Philly. Uh, yep. We're very happy about that. It runs its own freedom schools and freedom schools continues to this day. Um, the other thing that I'll mention quickly is that from the beginning, yep. we knew that this would be our chance to reimagine education. So with our high school students, every year we select an academic book a book that we think is uh, uh, sets the standard in its subject and in its complexity and its level of scholarship. And those students read that book over the course of the summer mm -hmm. and create projects, create uh, engagement with the text. And then during the year round, which we're coming up on now, we pick another book. And what we're really doing is destroying all the stereotypes. Freedom schools in Philadelphia do not uh, do not, we're not looking for all the 4.0 students, all the students who took AP. There's some students we have who are like that. We have other students who are barely getting by. And we want that real combination because we understand that every student can learn and we don't lower expectations. We set them beyond where students can see. And That's then right. when they reach and exceed those, we realize, okay, we have destroyed now the idea that somehow you are incapable. So mm -hmm. freedom, freedom is at the core, but that, but that, that's the conventional history. Now, I won't go on more than to say this. You asked me what are freedom schools? That's the history we kind of know. And we've talked about the other answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't really, I, I don't know. And I say that after 30 years in the classroom, uh, in the college classroom, elementary school classroom, I started teaching in South Street, South uh, South uh, Nashville, South Street Community Center when I was after my senior year in college, before I went to law school. These are little children, first, second, third graders. And I've taught every level in one way or the other. But most of the time I've spent in college level and high school level. But I, 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 I'm not having a crisis at this moment. I think mm -hmm. we, have, we have to seriously, seriously get down to the business of defining what we mean when we say freedom. Mm. what we mean when we say freedom. And I think, yes, jump in, please. I was, so I was jumping in because when, you know, you gave like the kind of history, the concept mapping of like where we were, where we are now, and even add a piece of that, right? The center trying to incorporate different elements of, of freedom schools from history and tradition into to our work to build and recruit more black teachers. Um, but I can most certainly understand the pause and reflection on like the second part of, I don't, I don't know, but I think an important piece to where we can start to, to answer that question <laughs> or to fill that gap of not knowing or what is freedom is when folks start a freedom school or you want to invoke the spirit of a freedom school, what's the basis of your concept, right? Like why? 
What's the purpose? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is consult our ancestors, consult yeah. our memory. Um, this, and we, we, we had those moments of crisis several times in the freedom school movement in Philadelphia, the renewed freedom school movement, again, going back to Churchville in the sixties, but that renewal in the nineties, the challenge, one of the challenges we have in terms of education is everybody seems to know what's best for black people. And they know so much, you know, so much without asking black people, but you know so much about what's best for black people. And really what that is, is what's best for whatever agenda the people who know so much mm -hmm. about what's best for black people have. And that agenda is usually tied to the political economy of the country. And this is why I said, you know, today would be a good day to have a conversation because in my education in black, uh, in black America class, we're reading a book uh, called the education of blacks in the South. By, okay. James, by James Anderson, Professor James Anderson, Education of Blacks. And it's, it's, a, it's a book I've mentioned before, but every time, and I, it's probably my dozenth time reading the book and going through it with students. Coming out of enslavement, African people had their own ideas about education. We started schools before the end of enslavement. Of course, there in Philadelphia, we had schools that predate enslavement, with none more, none more famous than the Institute for Colored Youth, which is why we have a Caddo division in, 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 in the freedom school movement now. Yes. Um, now, when people came in who were not black, uh, the white philanthropists in the North, people like Andrew Carnegie, uh, the Fords, the Rockefellers, uh, they uh, put in league with Southern business folk and Southern government folk and said, we need these Negroes to be a laboring class. So we don't need all this Greek and Latin and classical education. We need to them focus on work. So you see something called the Hampton idea emerge in the 1870s and 80s. And that and that idea was basically train these uh, black people to have the skills we need to plug into the economy as it's moving into the industrial era, this kind of thing. Well, fast forward to 2021. It's the same thing. So much of the conversation we hear around what black children need is around what the economy needs. And so when you hear people talking about skill, development and skills and give them the type of skills that would allow them to get good earning jobs, all that's important. But is the, it, and, and when I worked for the school district, I used to ask questions in meetings like we would have meetings. They talk to all these consultants coming in and philanthropists. And I, and I said, this is this is all beautiful. Can I ask you a question? Just two questions. One, do you have children? Yes. Is this what they're doing? Well, uh, I don't see. No, I see very clearly. And so I'm asking you a question. If this is good enough for my children, <laughs> I want to know <laughs> whether it's good enough for yours. And so if you're considering getting in the black pipe, in the black teacher pipeline, and you're starting a, a concept like a freedom school or the freedom school spirit, mm -hmm. you want to go in communities. And the first thing we do is listen. What do you want? What do you need? This is what Charlie, uh, Charlie Cobb and them said. They went in Mississippi. You know, what's the problem? Yes. What's the system and what part of the system do we want to keep and what part of the system we want to throw away and what are we trying to accomplish? These are serious. So the first thing you do is sit and listen. Which yeah. is the Freedom Schools in Philly always had to partner with a community based organization. And we have the center now, the Center for Black Education Development. It's very important. Now. This is a question that changes over time and without consulting the ancestors, without mm -hmm. consulting the memory. We simply don't see where we've succeeded, where we failed and where we should make adjustments. Right. And, and so now, I mean, again, I'm thinking about this because, you know, we're about to go into year round in Philadelphia with Freedom Schools. And I'm very excited that team you got together with Stephanie and Asha Ray. I mean, this whole thing, I'm very excited about these weekly Mbangi sessions. Those you don't know, Mbangi is a, is a Congo word, it means a house without rooms. In other words, we're convening. We don't say think tank. We're trying to use language, which is going to become important in about, uh, about 60 seconds when I mention this. Because again, I'm drawing for these other sources to try to think about freedom. So, you know, the book we're reading, mm -hmm is a book we began reading a few months ago called The Lost Education of Horace Tate by Professor Vanessa Siddle Walker, which is the history of the black teacher force and the mm -hmm. black schools pre- Let me, let me be like you, Doc. Let me, because you know- Hey, I, you know, sure, too. Right <laughs> 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 hey, like hey, you, Doc. Hey, for real. Hey, look, y'all get up, look, y'all get up on The Lost Education of Horace Tate because Professor Walker, Dr. Walker, a former school teacher, 
PhD now on the faculty at Emory University for many years, has written a lot about the segregated schools in the South. She emphasizes the master teachers in the segregated schools that prepared students generation after generation after generation for excellence. Mm -hmm. Now, the fight to desegregate the schools wasn't about diminishing the quality of education many of those students got in the segregated schools. She's very clear about that. And what she, why she called that book The Lost Education of Horace Tate, she said one of the things we lost is our memory of the high standards many of our teachers had. So if you're coming into education, you're not coming as a fallback. Teachers were among the most respected people in the community. In fact, it was the teachers who recruited the students out of the segregated schools that killed Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. We all know about the Little Rock Nine. We just passed the anniversary of Little Rock Nine, 1957. I was with my students today. I showed them a picture of one of the sisters who was a member of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. But she had come from Dunbar which was a Rosenwald school and an all black teaching staff and had all this leadership and all this. And then she goes to Central and they got to fight the world. But in the history we get, we only see these black students appear out of nowhere like genies somehow making America great. Where did they go to school before they went to school? <laughs> and of course, the irony being that today the schools are more segregated than they were in 1954 nationwide, yes. which means did we kill Jim Crow? But let's let's like clarify that. that. Let's clarify that. When we say yes. more segregated, more segregated meaning by student population. By student uh, population. Not, not, not by, by teacher law. population. Because yeah, not by teacher population. No, we, we lost the teachers. Dominated. My, my friend. White women. <laughs> that's exactly right. And how do we, how, what did we lose? We were not talking teachers. about rebuilding the teacher pipeline if, if the teacher pipeline hadn't been smashed. We yes. smashed Jim Crow. Jim Crow turned around and punched us in the teacher okay. pipeline and smashed it. Right now. mouth. Now, let, now, exactly. Now, here's where the I don't know comes in, Shana. Mm -hmm. Last night, I was with my students at uh, at Howard Law School. Lord, I don't know what I did with the book. In fact, the book is probably hiding because they don't want me to bring this smoke. Yeah. Well, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. Here it is. No, because, because I'm saying, what is freedom? What is freedom, right? So I went back. We're talking about the cases that led up to Brown versus Board of Education, desegregation cases. Mm -hmm. And so I won't get into the whole legal background with the case law and all this kind of thing. But there was a real debate going on in the early 1930s among black scholars and educators on what to do while the legal strategy was being mounted to smash Jim Crow in terms of education. Mm -hmm. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote this in the pages of something called the Journal of Negro Education. And it cost me a pretty penny, but I finally got the full run of the Journal of Negro Education. I would spend my whole life doing nothing but reading. That's why I know in Philadelphia Freedom Schools, at the core of our work is intellectual, intellectual work. work, reading work. It's and in other words, people say, well, we all do intellectual work. That, my friends, three letter word, get ready, write this down. Three letter word, get ready, write this down. I'm sorry, I'm repeating like Umar Johnson. Everybody come. <laughs> Because we're not talking about FDMG or some made up place at the school we talking about exists. Freedom yeah. School. This, when people say, oh, we do intellectual work, that, my friends, is an L I E. That's a lie. I'm, I'm not even going to beat around. I'm too old now. That's a lie. In other words, if you're going to be a teacher, ask yourself where the bar is set, who set the bar, why they set the bar there and then look at your students and ask yourself, is the bar as it is set a standard that these students could easily exceed? But the bar was set by somebody else. Mm -hmm. We haven't even defined. And people say, we do intellectual work. No, you don't. I've been in this classroom too long. I've seen too many master teachers who are doing intellectual work. So this is what Du Bois writes. Du Bois, in a special issue of the Journal of Negro Education, 1935. Does the Negro need separate schools? Now, mind you, they're in segregated schools. Du Bois said, look, we are already in segregated schools. So until we integrate these schools, he said, the Negro had to accept separate schools for the moment. It was either that or nothing in many places. And this is what he says. We had jolly well better stop looking in through white schoolhouse windows like a destitute orphan on Christmas Eve and start turning our own schools into first rate schools. What are you what are you aspiring to over there? I know you want the money. We want the money. I know you want the access. Do you see these master teachers you have? 
Now you're going to trade your teachers for them. We didn't even anticipate what happened, which was the erasure of the black teaching force. Yes. Black principals turned into classroom teachers and then quietly given the door. My friend Leslie Fenwick finishing a manuscript called Jim Crow's Pink Slip. What happened to those black teachers? And we talked about that too. I'm just gonna mention one other thing he says. This is what he says. He says, accepting race hatred as a brutal but real fact, black people ought to forego, and this is a quote, using a little child as a battering ram to get into white schools and mm -hmm. consider that child's own soul. Now, in other words, when we think of our children being sent into classrooms where the agenda is being set by other people for what they should do, you know, the only people who stand between whatever agenda outside the school is being put into the school and that child is the teacher. Yep. So we have to rebuild this pipeline if for no other reason than while you're worried about test scores and you're worried about grades, and we all understand that, and the state test and the local test, and, and then somebody who has nothing to do with education, whose own children are nowhere near the curriculum they're trying to push down your throat, has donated all this money because they've looked at the demographics and decided this is where the jobs are going to be in 10 years. This is where the jobs are going to be in. Let's back map that into this classroom because I know better than your parents and your community what's best for your child. The only person standing between these mad scientists I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. William Watkins, get a book by William Watkins called The White Architects of Black Education or read James Anderson's book where you see where they were meeting at Cape and Spains, West Virginia, meeting at Lake Mohawk, New York, leading meeting to talk about Negro education. And guess who was not invited? The Negro. The Negroes. <laughs> you know what I'm but, but we know why, right? You know when, why? People, when people assess this, like we know why, right? It's, it's about what feeds the American economy and it always has to be a sacrificial lamb That's and it's right. always going to be black folks until right. we decide that we're not going to be that right anymore which we can i mean it is this these things aren't mutually exclusive unless they are so you know the test of whether or not people have the best interests of black children at heart when you start articulating the best interests of black children from black communities and they either say okay or they say well i'm not sure <laughs> i didn't told you <laughs> <laughs> we're black, and I'm and now we're going to use the momentum of memory to talk about this. And if your response is, I'm not sure, then what you're saying is, I know better than you about your children. And my thing is, you might. Uh, do you have children? Yes. Are they? It is, no. OK, then what you're saying is I, in fact, am a colonizer. <laughs> and what I have in mind for your children is better than you. Now, how does that relate to freedom schools? It relates very directly. What we have found is that when we embrace this highest aspiration and sink our roots very deeply culturally into a clear African-centered grounded conversation, it transforms the way our young people look at education. Yes. Now, now the problem we have, however, is that when we start talking about African-centered education, people eyes glaze over because you can talk about Middle East English. You can talk about Beowulf and the Canterbury Tales all day long. You can bring in Shakespeare. You can talk about, you know, James Finemore, Finemore Cooper. Yeah. But the minute you start talking about West Africa or Egypt, well, I, I'm not sure they're interested in that. Oh, you were interested in the Canterbury Tales? <laughs> really? How many more times are we going to see Sir Gawain and the Green Knight made into a movie. It's made another damn movie about. <laughs> I don't want to see it again. I saw, I read it in high school. It was forced upon me. Now, when I was at the school district, we having these curriculum wars. I'm saying we should be reading Sundiata. We should be reading some Tahu Tep. And they say, well, I'm not sure the students are interested in that. Okay, let me just ask you a question. Do you have children? Yes. Okay. Um, what are they reading? Because my child's probably reading the same thing. Yeah, Shakespeare. Okay. Um, did you ask the child whether she wanted to read? Uh, uh, two two merchants of Verona. Did you ask the child whether he wanted to read Othello or did you say this is the curriculum? Only when it comes to us engaging our long memory do you turn to the child as the expert. Yes. <laughs> because, because in your mind, you know better what these black children should learn. Again, if you're a black teacher or if you're you coming into teaching, just because you black doesn't make you equipped to teach. Now all, we got to get into teacher folk and folk, but no question. And, <laughs> and teacher education programs. We've heard Baba and Mecca talk about this many times. Yes. Teacher education program curriculum must be reconstructed, which leads me to the only other point I wanted to bring up as we have in this conversation. So I'm saying, knowing very well that if we start our history with enslavement, as the great John Henry Clark used to say, everything since then looks like progress. I said, what 
can I step outside of this concept of freedom mm -hmm. and freedom schools long enough to think about it from groups that have the momentum of memory intact? Because one of the things we have to do and we've done, and I'm very proud of the fact we did this, particularly when we put our Pathways curriculum together with our Pathway to Jehudi, Pathway to Ma'at, the Sankofa Rewind, you know, Sashet, which is the Egyptian concept of counting and measuring and science and math, who is a black woman. You know, when we put that together, the, anybody writing curriculum, please come. And let's have one of these Thursdays devoted to comparing what you're doing to what we did. I would love it. And this is a direct challenge to any experts who know better about black children and learning teaching. They bring your curriculum. We bring our curriculum. We go line by line and we can have a public conversation about it. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that is a reconstructing process. It's very difficult because mm -hmm. you got to have the ability to master enough concepts and bring people together to put a curriculum together that isn't just about, you know, engendering pride and self-respect, although those are extremely important. important. So it's about content too. Yes about intellectual work. It's very difficult work, which means language work, which means concept work, which means replacing concepts with other concepts that ground us, that blow up that slave ship. Yes. Because human beings came, that's just a mode of transportation. It is not an identity, except in a society to have people think, y'all came here knowing nothing but naked. We gave you a school and look how far you've come. No, you think you know better about black people? Well, no, no, that's not what happens. Anyway, you can't know better about black people when you don't know anything about black people. Anything, and that includes <laughs> us too. So yes. we, know, I mean, we know our communities, we know our experiences, but our memory has been assaulted for centuries. So I said, is there, are there groups that did freedom schools that didn't start from having to reconstruct memory. Mm -hmm. Now, my dear beloved sister Shana, common sense would tell us, are there groups in the United States of America, in North America, Central America, Latin America, that have cultural memory intact, that didn't go through enslavement, but who were assaulted? Mm -hmm. Who would they be? They're not us. But they brought us here. It's not the Europeans. They came here. So right. who, else, who else would it be? What's the other I mean, big group? Native brothers and sisters. Exactly. The First Nations. So I said, dude, Native Americans, did they? I mean, certainly they didn't have freedom schools. So what did they create? Or did, did they, right? And and that's that's another concept I want to get into later. They didn't have what we call freedom schools, but what did they have? Survival, Survival schools, school. two of which okay. still exist. These are the ones in the Twin Cities, one in Minneapolis and one in St. Paul, the American Indian Movement. And then this is a book called Free to be Mohawk, Indigenous Education of the Aquasansi mm -hmm. Freedom School. <laughs> the Mohawk have a freedom school to this day in upstate New York and in Canada. Mm -hmm. And look at this definition of freedom. Oh my goodness. This is the um, Aquasane Freedom School. Okay. By the way, the Aquasane, they were called the Mohawk. These are one of the groups that they call the, in the Iroquois Federation, the so called Iroquois Federation. Federation. Yep. So it's very important to understand the um, Haudenosaunee, who are as far as you can get in New York without leaving the country in Southern Canada, they're very serious about this. So they say, here it is. The Akosani Freedom School is essentially a place for cultural and linguistic survival. When the school was named, the word freedom was chosen because, according to founder Ron LaFrance, quote, it is precisely what our traditions teach us to be a free people conscious of our rights and obligations to ourselves, to other nations and to our mother earth. While the school's name reflects these values, those who oppose the idea and y'all think about this. These are the people who know better for black children and for <laughs> their children. Yeah. Those who oppose the idea, oppose the idea, referred to it as the, quote, free to be dumb school, end quote. Over the years, students were teased for going to a school that wasn't considered academically challenging. Pause. All you curriculum writers that think you know better about black children, you can spell anything in the black historical memory if somebody put a gun to your head, but you somehow know about high academic achievement. It's a L I E. Go on. Over the years, students who were teased for going to a school that wasn't considered academically challenging was in, was small in comparison to public schools and was conducted entirely using the Mohawk language. They built the school in part to preserve the language that they had. One former student remembers, 
it wasn't considered a very cool place to go to school. Now, that's not true. For, 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 all our young people love the school, right? Did, other yeah. other kids thought we didn't have to do the same things they did. Like the curriculum wasn't the same, but actually it was. We learned math and science. We learned all our subjects and we learned in the language. That in itself was twice as hard. We had to deal with name calling and teasing. The reason I bring that up is because when we start talking about black history and culture, it is, it is generally dismissed, even by the most well-meaning friends of the Negro race. Yep. Because they don't know nothing about it. We don't know enough about it. And so when they come in and say, well, I understand y'all want them to learn some history and that's all important, but we got to be rigorous. The, the chef's kiss of racism in a statement like that. Yeah, we understand the history is important and we'll have some stuff and we'll do some dances and we'll put some foods in and we'll, we'll have a map of Africa. But we also have to be rigorous okay so you don't identify rigor with our languages our memory and our institutions you what? identify rigor with whiteness yes which gets me to the point that i've come always on, made come on, come on now when people use language like the bar whose bar are we talking about that slow ass <laughs> bar, that, that little bar that created math and science no i'm sorry that's not europe that's africa um, yeah. that slow bar that somehow created uh, poetry and music and, and migrated and populated the world. Oh, no, that's not Europe. That's Africa. Y'all better back up off. Yes. This right here. Yes. But the bar, who's the bar, or, or the trashing of African centered schools. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, they talking all that African centered, you know, stuff. But the kids are still struggling. But you going to white schools with no history. <laughs> we didn't indoctrinate you in American history and kids still aren't learning. That's so right. Why? I, I, I'm just confused. Well, well, but this is uh, see, and now we've gotten to the point, Shana. Now we've gotten to the delicate issue. This is the delicate issue. The delicate issue is, as it relates to particularly to teacher education, the delicate issue is that we haven't had a serious, full, immersive conversation and then executing what we come up with around what we mean by African centered. This isn't just about changing the colors. This isn't and we're in Kente, like and we're in Kente. Kente. That's, that's, about. that's exactly right. So that's why I said, let me back up off of all these years and come at it from a, a, an angle of people who never lost the culture, but who are being threatened. And this is where the indigenous education traditions, including literal freedom schools, <laughs> become very valuable to us. Because see, we're not talking about a Mohawk. We're not talking about um, uh, a freedom school uh, that is based in any one particular set of cultural frameworks. We're talking about having to create a framework that is ultimately uh, a kind of tapestry that is kind of remixed African. So it's not a small thing for us to introduce terms like Mbangi. It's not a small thing for us to introduce pathways to Jehudi. Why? Jehudi is the Egyptian concept of intellectual excellence in reading and writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's all, oh, well, y'all changed the symbol. Why does that change? No, 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 no. What we're doing is reorienting ourselves to how much we valued reading and writing because that tradition isn't just in Egypt. That tradition gets on the boats. It gets on the boats in the scripts of West Africa, including Arabic that they are writing. It gets, it stays on the boats once it comes here. And even as the attempt is made to erase that tradition from those Africans, their value for education persisted. It's still so that in, in Carter, Carter Woodson's first book, one, the first book he wrote is The Education of the Negro yep. prior to 1861. So what we see, the Institute for Colored Youth in, in, in Pennsylvania, when we see in the South, these small pockets, it's not that they love the English language. It's that they're going to apply their zeal for education to whatever there is to be learned to move us. Yes. And they never disrespected the Africa that continued. Meaning what? Respect your elders. Respect your community. The things they're talking about in the indigenous education was also in the black American education. And now when we start talking about a teacher pipeline, we have to rebuild the teacher pipeline in part because black children are still going to school expecting to respect the teacher, but the many, many times the teacher either don't know nothing about these young people, have contempt for these young people. And so now what ends up happening is contempt. Now the student is pushing back and who gets victimized? The children. It's the children. The children get blamed because they are following the rule that they've been trained to follow. 
I came in the classroom trying to respect me. You call me out my name. You're trying to shorten my name. My name is not Shay. My name is Shaquana. You can't say it. You won't take the time to learn it. I'm not letting you call. I heard your friend call you that. No, that's my friend. I don't know you. Now I got a pink slip sitting in the principal's office. And on paper, I'm the problem. No, the problem is we need some black teachers who are no, nursing just culture in the classroom. Literally last week. Were you? Were you? We had to go, we, it was Hispanic Heritage Month and we were talking about how you respect and affirm folks, right? So people choose to disrespect or not see things that they feel like are foreign to them. So I had Gerardo uh, Munoz on. Yes, oh, I saw that. That's right, that was last Thursday. People yes. call him Gerardo. His name is not Gerardo. His name is Gerardo. Come on. I how to pronounce that man's name. Respect, put some respect on that man's name, put right? Some like respect to that man's name. His parents named him that. That's who he is. And when people dismiss who you are even by name, right? So if I don't, if I'm not willing to respect you by your name, I'm damn sure not willing to respect who you come from or your histories or your traditions. No, nope. nope. I can care you know less what? about you. Nope. But that says so much about the people who we allow to teach our children. That's so even right. as you're making this point yes. about integration, right? Um, and how they use kids as batting rams, right? Like that, that you resonates. Say you use so your child as a battering, battering ram. ram. That child never asked. To go in that school, and but why are we sending them? Because why are we sending well, them? Here's and, where it and, and to think about the 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 trade off of of what we were trying to what we were asking for, right? Yes. Um, and Mama Toya wrote this already. What we're asking for is our more resources, right? Like that's what that's we were right. asking for. We just hey, can oh. y'all got nice chairs and good books? Like, can we get a little money so at least the master teaching that we're doing, we can get those books and bonds, like. Why we always got to struggle when we got the match? Now watch, right? now watch this though. We had some of our own books. That's why Carter right. D. Woodson starts the Associated Publishers. He made a point. We need children's books. We need young adult books. We need history books. They're pumping books out, going into segregated schools. But these white legislatures and white city and local governments are holding these black schools hostage with uh, with funding. All that stuff is a problem. But, but here's the other delicate situation as we're thinking about this. When, do one of the reasons Du Bois writes that in the mid thirties, that y'all using these black children as battering rams to get into white school, he's making an argument that is very delicate. When we say we, that we is not on the same page. He is critiquing the black upper class. He's you're going to use the children of these farmers and these poor black people who have moved to the city to advance what is essentially a class agenda. Yes. <laughs> In other words, and so let's fast forward to where we are right now. Many of the advocates for black education, number one, wouldn't be caught dead sending their children to the schools that they somehow know better than these poor black people and these working class black folk like the communities we came out of. And number two of the piece, one is you wouldn't be caught dead. You wouldn't put your own children. This is inside the black community. The what? second is the pursuit of integration meant access for the higher up you are in the black class structure the more the access meant something the lower down and you were in the class structure it turned into all your teachers disappeared and you got teachers who didn't like you and the next thing you know the only thing they want from you is if you can run fast and shoot a basketball at which point they will let you into all of those schools they kept you out of <laughs> they, want, they want the 4.0s the ones who scored the five on the ap exam and the ball players but you rescue <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic point on that. And I probably need to do a show on this. Like this obsession with proximity to whiteness. Obsession. And the, and the, and the, but the obsession is not an obsession. This is Du Bois's point. The obsession is not as large an obsession the deeper down you go into class structure. Du Bois said, these you petty bourgeois Negroes. Yes. And y'all are using easy. these poor black people's children as battering rams to get in so you can get next to these people. This is a sickness. Yes. <laughs> poor, poor black people, poor black children are always the pawn for somebody else's. Always. Business, right. Always. So even as the top of the show, when I was talking about the, epi the epidemic that's happening with gun violence, mm. let's be clear about who's dying in these streets. And let's be very clear about who's killing each other. It's poor black youth. That's who it is. That's right. That's, that's exactly who it is. That's right. But these are trade-offs of when, we don't want to put money into black communities so that they can have valuable freedom schools. This is what we do when we want to train for certain aspects of the economy and we don't want to put money into teachers or people 
caring, culturally relevant black black people who want to be in front of young black children. This is this is the result. This is the result. And I was thinking well, about like this is not this is not something immediate that's this happened, right? This is oh, no, a problem no, no. that has been built no, no, in fact, over time. In fact, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because not only is that not the priority, the priority is the exact opposite. You see, the reason, and you see it in the literature, you see it in the arguments that they're having at these conferences where no black people are allowed. <laughs> yes. They're talking about where do we need to slot these black. Now, at that point, we're talking about the 1880s, 90s, 1900, 1910, 20, 30. They need black labor. So you got to have a minimum level of skill. And increasingly, black people are moving from an agrarian population to by the 1950s and 60s, increasingly urban. And you need them. But what happens when the economy shifts and it begins to shrink? Now there's surplus labor who you're still trying to figure out, how can I monetize this population? Well, guess what? Prison. Guess what? The link, that is a budget too. So when people are threatened, they say, yeah, black on black violence. We just have the, your, the police budgets are swelling. So not only is it that you don't want these young people to maximize their human potential and help the community develop, you want them in a position where you can pay yourself using their parents' tax dollars to yes. guard them and lock them up. In other words, this isn't just benign, as you say, and its roots go back to enslavement. This yeah, is the whole point about the industrial prison co- yes! uh, complex or the uh, cradle to prison pipeline, all That's of that. Right. And all of this is intentional and all of it is purposeful. That's right. Um, and, but, you don't, and you don't break it by having polite conversations about how can we come together on what? The, no, we're not. <laughs> so listen, right. So listen, with you with that energy you just brought, because this is yeah. another point in the connection that I wanted to draw when we talk yes. about freedom schools. So when we talk about freedom schools, we talk about SNCC. I always think about the comparison of the Black Liberation Movement, right? The Ooh. Black Panther Party. And folks didn't call their things freedom schools, but they had liberation schools. Liberation right? schools. Very similar to what freedom schools are and how they existed. But That's the right. point with Black Panthers where they were educating to liberate, right? Mm-hmm. We're going we to teach you about yourself. Uh, we're going to teach you how to survive in this world. We're going to teach you who your enemy is and how to conduct yourself accordingly. Well, here, I think, and again, man, sis, this is heavy hitting conversation right here. Y'all understand we ain't got but a few minutes once <laughs> a month, but we have this year round every week with these young people. Now, understand the conversation we're having. We're having this conversation with 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds who don't ever get to have this conversation. This is this is part of what it looks like, our conversation. And what you just what you just raised, another sensitive issue. Mm-hmm. Let's add this to the issue of the goals and objectives of integration, where it failed, where it succeeded. Let's add it to the class discussion that we're having within black communities. And now we add another layer with the Panthers and liberation schools. Again, the, the, the ambivalence, in fact, in many ways, outright hostility to connect education of black children to the long genealogy of African learning traditions. Mm -hmm. One of the things the Panthers did well was come in and listen and address community needs, the free clinics, the food program. One of the things they failed at is grasping how the long view of memory could enhance that work. So it's a very materialist kind of approach. In Mm -hmm. other words, you know, I understand Africa and all that's great, that's that cultural nationalism. We got to deal with this critique of capitalism. We got to, it's all true. But if you Mm -hmm. go too far in that direction, you will end up in a place where that class-based analysis yep. will simply trap you in perpetual, in fact, what, what was the phrase that the Panthers used to use? Survival pending revolution. Mm. So in other words, there because it's kind of frenetic. See, when you connect to the longer traditions, you're developing yourself intellectually in addition to dealing with the practical real world problems we face today creating institutions, feeding people, clothing people, creating spaces where people can enjoy their life, you're also connecting to the why. See, the thing that has to be displaced, and this is why the whole idea of classical education is not a problem when you're talking about white classical education. Yes. So a few of these children learn Greek and Latin, and there's no problem. Wait, Egyptian hieroglyphs? Well, I don't understand. The children won't be interested. The children are interested in Greek? Now, I took enough Attic Greek when I was in graduate school because my advisor, who's one of the world's great authorities on Egyptian hieroglyphs, also knows Greek. So he made us learn enough Greek to begin to do some translations and be able to compare. Guess what? 
we turn around to freedom schools year round, I would come and we would begin in the late 90s, early 2000s. I put enough Greek on the board and enough Metanetra on the board. I get expose y'all to this a little bit. Why? We're going to stop worshiping at the foundation of Greek and Rome. And what the Panthers often did, unfortunately, was not see in the liberation schools to the degree I think was necessary, the value of embracing those African learning traditions that predate enslavement. Mm -hmm. Because that is the intellectual foundation, not just for African memory, but for world memory. And it isn't just about self-esteem. I think it was a fundamentalist understanding. And this isn't a condemnation of liberation schools or of all the parents, because I think a great number of them understood that. But I'm saying as it is narrated, we have to take from that tradition, those liberation traditions, an uncompromising confrontation with a system that you can't compromise with. You can't compromise with the system. It's set up to do what it's doing. It's not broken. Yes. You understand? The Panthers got that. And these young people, you can absolutely see the earmark. At the same time, when we listen to like Bob el Mecki, when you listen to a Sharif el Mecki in terms of his educational upbringing, the schools, the African-centered schools that he came up through, yep. that I his mother brought him through, the class liberation, those schools understood the value of that thrust. And far too often, I think those traditions were at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. Instead of figuring out ways to blend it together. It's a yes. delicate conversation, though, Shane. I think we have to have yeah, it. I, I agree. And I err on the side of unity and finding the larger concepts and the more progressive concepts in both of them. Yes. Right? Um, because I, I also believe, right, like it's a, several different ways to skin a cat, uh, for lack of a better word. There are different ways to get at what we're getting at. Yes. Everything couldn't be about nonviolence. Everything also couldn't be bust you in the head and we ready for war. But right. I also believe that those concepts have, have a place and can it coexist in they a space and what's needed to, to move towards towards liberation. That's right. And um, they're not and they're not mutually exclusive. Bob El Mecchi tell you when they're doing martial arts, when they're doing they that is a way of centering. Martial arts aren't about fighting people. <laughs> nope. They're about control. Yeah. <laughs> they're about control. Opening yourself up. Discipline. And, and we and when you said when you said nonviolence made me think of Dr. King as a new book on Martin Luther King. Yeah, yes, on that. Yeah. nonviolence yeah. was a tactic. Like that's just it. Just was a tactic. Well, well, e even even with that, for many of the folks, it was a tactic. For King, he would say it's a way of life for me. I can't be non. I I gotta be nonviolent. And the rest of y'all, I understand many of you is a tactic. But it's very interesting because the King that gets edited out mm -hmm. is the King who uh, late in life before his assassination, he was in a meeting and Andrew Young was in this meeting and he had just come from, I think he was in Newark, remember 1967, and he had just met with Amiri Baraka, Baba Amiri, who's now, of course, an ancestor. And he comes back into a conversation, Andrew Young is in the room and he's having a heavy critique of capitalism. And Andrew Young is like, well, I don't know about that. And Dr. King says, Andy, I don't want to hear from you right now. Because you're a capitalist. Mm. Now, let's pause here right now. Now, fast forward to 2021. People love teaching about Martin Luther King and nonviolent resistance. The king they absolutely reject is the one that said this society is rotten in terms of its economy, in terms of its militarism. And say, oh, yeah, we, we like that, too. No, you don't. Because you want black and brown children to get paint and buckets and go paint and clean up their schools on Martin Luther King's birthday, things that they already paid their taxes for you to do. <laughs> so, but they went, and then you want to say, Dr. King is not. No, Dr. King would be like, every last one of y'all, put them paint buckets down. down. I want to know where the budget went <laughs> to pay for public works and school yeah. teachers and sanitation, which is how I got killed going to Memphis. Don't y'all paint another wall. They lying to you <laughs> about yeah. my agenda. And if Andrew Young comes and says, well, Dr. King wanted, you go find them people who pull out my conversation with him. I don't want to hear from you, Andy. You're a capitalist. But this is what <laughs> happens when we allow, you know, the enemy um, to control the narrative. Which is why we had to have freedom schools. In <laughs> fact, right. You know, we always say in freedom schools, our goal is to one day drop freedom from it. This should just yeah. be school. School. <laughs> this is school. It should just be school. It should just be school. That's all it should be. That's it should right. just be school. That's right. Um, you shouldn't have to go to a place to feel like you got to get free. Um, How about that? <laughs> you just shouldn't. Shouldn't have to go to a place to feel like you have to get free. Get but, um, 
as as long as we breathing, we won't we won't continue on this. Oh, I'm glad you said that, Shane. Hold on, this is at the end of this book. This is the end of this free to be Mohawk book. In fact, let me just this is the last quote I'll pull from a book if I can find it quick. Yes, yes. An interview you one of the children who went to the uh, Aquasani Freedom School said the Aquasani Freedom School has to exist. Otherwise, we will cease to exist. Yes. Amen. And I said, yeah, that's what we, we got to have the freedom <laughs> school. Yes. Otherwise, Otherwise we, we stop exist. existing. Yeah, no question. Because if we don't, who will? Oh, no. And I'm talking don't. about we, and let's be clear, I'm not talking about we as in like me, Shana Terrell or Dr. Carr or the center. If we as a community don't, who will? We have to continue telling our story. We have to continue the oral tradition. Um, and shout out to the Native American folks who are continuing their survival school shout to out. continue to fight. Shout out to the Black Panther Party. October is coming up. It's their uh, their history month. I think yeah. it's actually their 55th year. Oh, um, yeah, it is. Of yeah. the Black Panther Party. Yeah, so we, right. hopefully we uh, hope to have some guests on from Black Panther Party um, next month. So definitely. Oh, wonderful. Some of the Philly crew who remember the, the first time they came with Philadelphia Freedom Schools when we read uh, We Want Freedom, when we had Abu Jamal, mm -hmm. and then all the old Panthers came and did the, and did a community forum with like, I'm acting like, yeah, that's that's right there. Right <laughs> I've been reading about this stuff with, with Move and how some folks have left Move. I mean, you see the challenge, but yeah, see, that's all. And see, that's the other thing. And I'm so glad Kelly wrote this book, Sister Kelly. Dr. Mm -hmm. Kelly, we have to remember our own institutional memory in terms of freedom schools. Yes. I remember, for example, in freedom school, they were saying, we, we came to the table with Children's Defense Fund. We got to be able to measure reading and math because it's tied to the school district. They were like, ah, no, I don't know. Then a few years later, Children's Defense Fund got all this money from you and Kaufman Foundation and was like, we're going to start measuring reading and improvements. We try to tell y'all. And then we hired our own external evaluator to look at the test scores. And because we not, we not, we know what's going to gonna find. You know what they found? Y'all curriculum made it jump because we don't remember that. Now we invite people in. OK, this is good. This is nice. But uh, we need to have standards. You get you, we're going to make one lip out of two. You have a top and a bottom lip. Give me a three. <laughs> Zip it <laughs> or ever, or you bring your curriculum, we'll bring the pathways curriculum line by line. <laughs> I'm tired of this. I stand <laughs> on, I stand on the intellectual tradition of our foremothers and forefathers. And if you want to get down, here's in the words of Beanie Siegel from South Philly get down or lay down. <laughs> uh, we're not going to do is compare ourselves to our grandchildren. It's not going to happen. Or maybe it is. At that point, we have a different conversation. Yes. <laughs> but you're going to go ahead and tell us people get out of Fully prepared to have. <laughs> We're not going to use our children as a battering ram. But anyway, no. do boys. <laughs> yeah. like, you know. Anyway. I mean, that, that concept in itself, though, and I think that was very powerful for you to touch on today because I think we should reflect in the present. How many other things are we using poor Black children as a battering ram for? Um, everything mm. we got our babies fighting our fights yeah we got our babies fighting our fights tim scott joe manchin Kristen cinema nobody should be in the street anyway mm. anyway it's all good we got our babies <laughs> fighting our fights <laughs> but we shouldn't we should have our babies fighting our fights. no nope. but but mm. but if the adults aren't going to fight Wesley Cook was 16 years old when he took over communication for the Philly chapter of the Black Panther Party as a high school student at Benjamin Franklin High School. Of course, we know him now as Mumi Abu Jamal on the cover of that book, We Want Freedom. That's why we read that book. We want high school students to understand if it's not going to happen, the L you take will be your own. So therefore, we're going to help y'all. You know Forget all them adults that's not coming with us right now. You think if they, would, they wouldn't have the, the Mohawk Freedom School. They wouldn't have the Aquanasi Freedom School. Aquasani Freedom School. Well, you know, I love me some um, Ella Baker, and I believe that the fight should be in the hands of the young, right? That's, like, right. That's right. Oh, yeah, next month. Uh, we're coming up, well, starting tomorrow in the month of October, it'll be the 60th anniversary conference for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Last year, it would have been last year, but of course, COVID is going to be online. So I'll make sure you have yes. information. And, uh, yeah. and shout out to Darian Johnson. Um, yes. She is going to have the opportunity to have a one on one interview um, with one of the members of SNCC. Um, so shout out to our Freedom School Sister Darian, yes, for, for making us proud. Um, and we've we got a long tradition. Sister Colia Clark, uh, so many in Philadelphia who were part of SNCC. And of course, the great John Churchville, who was part of this SNCC and the Northern Student Movement, Freedom Day Library. 
So yeah. our roots go way back with them. No question. This, those are our people. So as we doing this, y'all, you heard Dr. Carr, right? We we can go through the history and the tradition of what a freedom school is, but reflecting on what what is freedom? What, what is does that freedom? what does that mean? Mm. Um, so when you thinking about starting a freedom school, having a freedom school, participating in one, what is freedom? What does that actually mean? And definitely applying that to modern day context. And Dr. Carr talked a lot today about memory. So let's not let's not get amnesia out here, folks. No. Uh, when we out here doing the work, let's not be at the helm of it trying to reinvent the wheel either. Um, right. We long history, tradition, models, people are still alive and surviving who are willing to give input um, yes. and help us out. We're not alone. We're not, We're not alone. alone. We need to be doing this together. Dr. Carr, any final words on Freedom School? Thank you. Thank you for continuing them. Thank you for linking them. Thank you for being this link in the chain. Thank you for remembering. Thank you for creating a liberated territory in the words of my elder, uh, Haile Garima. Thank you for creating liberated territory. And for those of you considering being teachers, y'all tune in on noon and Thursdays and come into this space and bring somebody else. Cause oh, we watch, it, watch it later because y'all need to be teaching. So if that's we, true, <laughs> all the teachers, that's so right, that's watch right. it live, we but... need to rebuild that Master yeah. teacher, you can folks. catch us on YouTube, Citizens Edge, Facebook page. Citizen Edge, Facebook shout page. out, no question. Yes, these Twin City cats. You know, I got to come up here and look for these survival schools, yo. I am yes. embarrassed I didn't know shout about the risk. Well. Citizens Edge in the center for giving us the opportunity to real people in a real yes. struggle, in the world, real work. Dr. Carr is, is definitely one of those folks. Nah, heart, heart of the Earth School in Minneapolis and Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul. I'm just telling you, the two survival schools, we're all in the network, y'all, and it ain't just black people. Our Spanish speaking kin, well, a lot of them Africans too. I'm just saying, freedom yes. schools in Philadelphia have always been more than us. Definitely have. We are, yeah. I'm, I'm still in this heavy pursuit of the black and brown get down and, and black and brown get down for I'm real. And you know, around Bakken, and we had Asians Americans United, so we had <laughs> we was not playing. <laughs> All of us are rooted in the Korean, United Cambodian, in the Chinese. Service. We had right. every Laotian. We was like, look, what, what do y'all want? Yeah. Either we all gonna be humans, or as Jesse Jackson used to say, "Cut us in or cut it out." <laughs> it ain't gonna be nothing. So, and exactly. we, we can do that too, because you know. Yes, but is. thank you, thank you, I love you for coming. <laughs> thank you, everybody, as always, for watching us every Thursday at twelve here at Building the Black Educator Pipeline. We mm -hmm. will see you guys next week. And if you're again, if you love Dr. Carr, he will be back, of course, next month. I know every Thursday, yeah. Us. And, and when I go to class, I'll take all your love to them. I got a black aesthetics class a little while, so they'll they all be waiting to hear the report. I told them I was coming in, so. Yes, shout out. But thank you, guys. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks see, for